Okay, now we're going to turn to solving some inequalities. And here we've got some linear inequalities and some quadratic, or excuse me, we've got a, a linear inequality, a quadratic inequality, and a quartic inequality, fourth degree polynomial. The basic idea is to, well, with the exception, linear ones are easy. Let's do the linear one first, and then we'll talk about the general procedure. So it's the same thing as though, for linear ones, it's the same thing as though it was an equation. The only thing you have to remember for a linear one is if you multiply or divide by a negative number, recall that the inequality flips. We won't have it in this problem. So what I'm going to do is subtract 4 from both sides. We'll have 2x is less than negative 15. Just divide both sides by 2. And we'll have x is less than negative 15 over 2. So again, in terms of a number line, there's negative 15 over 2. That says we're using everything less than that. People like to see interval notation a lot of times in calculus. So the solution set we could write as from negative infinity up to negative 15 over 2. You always use parentheses on infinity, positive or negative. And since the negative 15 over 2 is not included, we'll put a set of parentheses around that as well. Okay, so now kind of the general procedure. If you have higher degree polynomials, which we do in this case, typically what you want to do is factor it. Solve the corresponding equation as though it was equal to zero. So let's do that first. Um, and I'm going to take it in a slightly different order. I'm going to make it equal to zero first. I'm going to try to factor it. So, okay, so this one's not too bad. We can use positive 2 and positive 4. Again, we need two numbers that multiply to positive 8 but add up to positive 6. So the solutions to this equation would be x equals negative 2 and x equals negative 4. I'm going to put those numbers on a number line. So there's negative 4 and negative 2. I'm putting open circles because what I need to do is I can already tell that these solutions will not satisfy the equation. If I put negative 2 in, I'm going to get exactly 0. Well, 0 is not less than 0, therefore negative 2 doesn't work. Likewise, negative 4 is not going to be a solution because I get exactly 0. That's what we just determined right here. So again, 0 is not less than 0, so I know that negative 4 is not going to work. Now the idea is from each interval that's left over, we have to pick a number and test it. Okay, so something less than negative 4, how about x equals negative 10? Now you could do one of two things. You could either plug it back into the original inequality. I like to put it where it's factored. So, you know, we've got x plus 2, x plus 4. I'm asking myself when I substitute in this x value, is it going to be less than 0? Well, so I'm just testing negative 10. And the thing that I, the reason why I like to put it into the factored form is, to me, it's less arithmetic. I get to be a little bit more, I would say lazy. To me, it's a little more efficient. It's more clever. Because notice I'm going to get a negative number right here, right? Negative 10 plus 2 is going to be a negative. Um, negative 10 plus 4 is going to be another negative number. Well, a negative times a negative is going to be a positive. A positive number is not going to be less than 0. So what that tells me is that no number smaller than negative 4 is going to satisfy my inequality. Well, let's try negative 3. So same thing, I'm going to put it into the factored form. Negative 3 plus 2, negative 3 plus 4. Is that less than 0? That's what I'm asking myself. Well, negative 3 plus 2 is going to be a negative number. Negative 3 plus 4 is going to be a positive number. A negative times a positive is definitely a negative number. And a negative number is less than 0. So everything, any number between uh, negative 4 and negative 2 is going to satisfy my inequality. And likewise, if you take something greater than negative 2, say x equals 0, you could also be thinking about the graph of in a, uh, a quadratic. If it, um, it would be another way to do this one. But in general, I think it's good to just test values, because that's what you have to do for, for um, higher ordered functions. And you may not know what those look like. So if we try 0, well, we've got 0 plus 2, 0 plus 4. Is that less than 0? Well, you're going to have a positive times a positive. This is clearly 8. And 8 is not less than 0. So it says the solution 
set in this case will be from negative 4 to negative 2. Again, we're using parentheses because those values are not included in the solution set. So we do the same thing if it, even if it's higher degree. We just try to factor. So I'm going to solve the corresponding equation. Notice we can factor out an x squared. We would be left with x squared minus 4x minus 21 equals 0. Well, again, I think this factors nicely. So how about negative 7 and positive 3? That's going to multiply to give us negative 21, but add up to negative 4. If you set each factor equal to 0, well, 0 squared will equal 0. Um, if we take x minus 7 and set it equal to 0, we'll get positive 7. And if we take x plus 3 and set it equal to 0, we're going to get negative 3. So again, my original inequality was strictly greater than 0. If I put in negative 3 or 0 or 7 into this original inequality, I'm going to get exactly 0, which is not greater than 0. So already I know those solutions don't work, so we just put open circles there. That's the common notation or diagram we use. Okay, so at this point, we just take, again, values from each of our intervals. And this time I'm going to have four intervals. So again, maybe I'll use x equals negative 10, x equals negative 1, x equals positive 1, and x equals positive 10. So again, I'm going to look at the factored form. We've got x squared times x minus 7 times x plus 3. And again, I want this to be greater than 0. Now, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to basically disregard the x squared term. You know, if I had this on a test, no matter which one of these numbers I put in, when I substitute it in for x and square it, this is always going to be a positive number, right, because we're squaring it. If you multiply, you know, a negative number by a positive, it doesn't change the sign. Likewise, a positive by a positive doesn't change the sign. So I'm going to be a little lazy and just, just, I'm not really forgetting about it. I'm just noticing that this term isn't going to change the sign. So will not change the sign when I look at these two terms. Okay, so x equals negative 10. Well, then I would have negative 10 minus 7. Negative 10 plus 3. Is that greater than 0? Well, we're going to get a negative multiplied by a negative. A negative times a negative is going to be a positive, so that'll be greater than 0. So anything smaller than negative 3 will work. Oops, I put x equals 1. I meant x equals negative 1. I think I said that. Hopefully I said that. So let's see, x equals negative 1. Okay, well, we're going to have negative 1 minus 7. Negative 1 plus 3. Is that greater than 0? Well, we've got a negative multiplied by a positive. A negative and a positive is going to be a negative number. That's not going to be greater than 0, so no number between negative 3 and 0 works. Okay, likewise, if we plug in x equals 1, we would have 1 minus 7, and then we would have 1 plus 3. Is that greater than 0? Well, we've got a negative number times a positive number. Well, that's going to be a, a negative times a positive is a negative, which again is not greater than or equal to 0. And if we try, say, x equals positive 10, we're going to have, well, 10 minus 7, 10 plus 3. That's going to be a positive times a positive which will certainly give us a number greater than 0. So that will also work. Okay, so to me it says the solution set, in this case, will be from negative infinity up to negative 3. Again, using parentheses because negative 3 is not in the solution. Use a little union sign. And then we go from 7 to infinity. So that would be our solution set. So again, you know, Obviously, if you have lots of zeros, here we had one, two, three zeros, which gave us one, two, three, four numbers to check. If you have five distinct zeros, for example, you would have six intervals to check. So 
This is the basic idea, though, with inequalities. You make one side equal to zero, solve the corresponding equation, put them on a number line, check those values themselves, and then you also have to pick a number from each interval and test it in the original inequality. So a little slow, a little tedious, but that's how it goes, unfortunately. So, all right, I hope this isn't too bad. The same idea, we're going to do the same thing with the other inequalities. We're just going to solve corresponding equations. For rational equations, we'll figure out where it's equal to zero or undefined, but then we're going to do the same thing. We're just going to make number lines. So, same idea. So, all right, I hope this helps.